Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to welcome you to, I hope, what promises to be a very interesting debate. Uh, my name is Pat Parody, and I am the Executive Director of the Centre for Constitutional Studies in the Faculty of Law here at the University. And I'd like to begin today's event by acknowledging that we are on Treaty 6 territory, which is the um, traditional land of many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people who um, signed Treaty 6 along with Crown representatives in 1876. That was some 140 years ago, and of course, as we all know and are learning, a, lo a lot has changed and, and happened in those 140 years. The Centre for Constitutional Studies, the, which is the organizer of this event, is one of three centres and institutes in the Faculty of Law, and it's one of many centres here at the University of Alberta. Our specific focus at the centre is the study of all things constitutional. So we do research and public legal education on the Constitution and constitutional issues. And just so you know what we do, or if you're curious to know what the Centre does, just go to our website. You can just Google the Centre for Constitutional Studies. But we put out two journals, one academic, one non-academic. We have law students every summer writing uh, articles about the Constitution in plain language in the hope that teachers and uh, just members of the general public can learn about the Constitution in, in simple and different kinds of ways. And we also put on events like this uh, during, during the course of the academic year. We have also got a downtown charter series where we have professors from the Faculty of Law going downtown to Enterprise Square to talk about specific sections of the charter. And so if you are interested in any of those uh, events, please do ensure that you leave us with your email address so that you can, uh, we can send you uh, information. Now, the Centre was established in 1988, that's 30 years ago now, during some very fractious constitutional debates in our country. Some of you will remember those. There were professors here at the University, Peter Mikkelsen being one, Tim Christian being another, who decided that someone in the province should be doing research on the Constitution, and this was during the Meech Lake discussions. You remember, some of you, how fractious those were. And so here we are. The Centre uh, takes every opportunity it can to educate the public about the Constitution, uh, which is what we hope to do today. <clears throat> now, just a few housekeeping matters. You'll see that we are recording the event, so if you have a cell phone, if you could please either turn it off or onto silent, that would be helpful. There, because there are, uh, there is video being taken. If if any of you don't want to be videotaped, we encourage people to move to the back of the room, and you won't be caught by the by the video feed. You uh, may or may not have taken an evaluation form when you entered, and but if you did, we would appreciate any feedback you have to give us as to what you thought of this event or any other events you think might be useful for us to host. And so uh, I will now begin to introduce our debaters. I wish I could do the debaters. But anyway, <clears throat> I'll begin with uh, Dave King, who is uh, a Canadian politician, many of you know, and a public education policy activist. As an elected member of the legislature in Alberta, he was legislative secretary to then Premier Peter Lougheed. That was from 1971 to 76. Uh, he was Minister of Education from 1979 to 1986 and Minister of Technology, Research and Telecommunications in 1986. Following his career in politics, Mr. King served for 10 years as Executive Director of the Public School Boards Association of Alberta and was subsequently recognized by the Alberta Teachers Association and the Canadian Teachers Federation for his years of service to education, especially for his considerable work as Minister of Education. Following his work as a charter member of the Edmonton Citizens for Better Housing Society and on several boards, including the Urban Reform Group of Edmonton, Boyle Street Community Services Cooperative, Boyle Macaulay Health Centre, Communitas, and Public Interest Alberta, he now serves on the Provincial Council of the Green Party in British Columbia, where he currently resides. And Dr. Kent Don Levy, who will be our second speaker this evening, holds a master's degree and PhD in education uh, as well as a law degree from the University of Saskatchewan. He was a teacher, a school principal, and an acting superintendent in both public and separate school systems before becoming a lawyer in 1985. 
Since that time, he has written extensively in the areas of school law, dealing with constitutional and tortious matters, published with colleagues the guides to uh, Alberta school law and assisted in the preparation of the guide to Ontario school law and the guide to Saskatchewan school law. He's lectured on constitutional issues at several universities, Queens, York, University of Alberta, University of New Brunswick, to name a few. Dr. Don Levy's research focuses on education law with a particular focus on constitutional law, negligence, and Catholic education. He has published in several journals on these topic, topics, and he currently teaches at the Workland School of Education in Calgary, where he is an associate professor and is also the chair of the University of Calgary Research Ethics Appeal Board. And so just before turning over the microphone to our first debater, uh, uh, Mr. David King, I just wanted to let you know how the evening is going to progress. So each of our debaters w is going to speak for between 15 and 20 minutes. Then they are going to exchange, uh, engage, I should say, in a five to 10 minute a dialogue with each other, asking each other questions and that sort of thing. And then we'll open the floor up to questions from you. And so, um, without further ado, uh, David. Thank you very much, Patricia. And let me say how much I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this conversation with Kent and with you. Any consideration of separate school education in Alberta involves a lot of different aspects. And so on any occasion, we're breaking into the circle of consideration at one point rather than at another point. So if we talk this evening about the focus of the debate, we leave unanswered a lot of issues about the history, about the feasibility, about how the transition might occur if it occurs. And some of those issues may come up in the course of conversation later in the evening. I think both of us would be quite happy to respond to that as the questions arise. But in the formal part of the meeting, what we have before us is a resolution that Alberta should change its dual school system of public and separate schools to one public school system. The debate is not about capacity, how unification might be accomplished. The debate is about whether or not unification ought to occur. And my challenge is to speak in favor of the resolution. I'd like to offer eight arguments in favor of the proposition. The first is that disestablishment and cohabitation is desirable because the continued existence of separate school education is contrary to the very spirit of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. The Charter itself acknowledges this at section 29. And I quote, nothing in this charter abrogates or derogates from any rights or privileges guaranteed by or under the Constitution of Canada in respect of denominational separate or dissentient schools. In other words, separate school education continues to this day in Alberta, notwithstanding the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, not in faithfulness to the rights. The second argument for unification is the assertion that separate school education is not an expression of a human right. Particularly, separate school education is not a manifestation of freedom of religion. Section 29 is not protecting one human right that for some peculiar reason applies to only one denomination and that has precedence over other denominations and other rights. Separate school education is a politically granted right that is available to only a few and is properly characterized as a privilege, which is why the word privilege is found in section 29 of the charter. Separate school education is a denominational right, not a human right. It is therefore a privilege. As some are privileged, 
others who are denied the same privilege are disadvantaged. It seems clear to me that separate school education is most certainly not a human right. Separate school education is not a right that is enjoyed by people of other faiths in Alberta. It is not a right enjoyed by Catholics in other provinces. I don't hear any argument that the right should be extended to other faiths in Alberta or in any other province. As a segue from one argument to the next, all of us need to remember that the politically granted privilege was intended to resolve political tensions 2,000 miles away, 250 or 150 years ago. The original marriage in Canada was not between two languages or two religions. It was between the <clears throat> two cultures. Religion was only important in the context of culture. And government involvement with or support for education was unimaginable in 1759. Over time, cultures change. The bilingualism and biculturalism royal commission of the last century was indeed about bilingualism and biculturalism. It was not about bi-denominationalism. By the middle of the 20th century, the focus had shifted from religion as one of two vital carriers of culture and had shifted to treating language itself as the single vital carrier of culture. Consequently, the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, further entrenched as the carrier of culture, language. It gave separate school education a pass. The third argument for, separate, for unification, rather, is that the political justification for separate school education has completely disappeared, as evidenced by two realities. One, the first party to the political arrangement, that is Quebec, has already abandoned denominational separate school education because the Quebecois consider it to be obsolete and irrelevant to their current interests and aspirations. Quebec did away with denominational education in 1997. Quebec, which insisted upon separate school education in Ontario and Quebec, subsequently in the Northwest Territories and the New Provinces, has done away with separate school education that is denominationally based. Given that the compact was originally between the vanquished and the victors, not Protestants and Catholics, and given that the rationale has evolved, maintenance of the compact now depends upon section 23 of the charter and language. The second reality is that institutionalized government prejudice against Roman Catholics is non-existent today and has been for years. And in my view, it is highly unlikely to re-emerge given the Charter of Rights. In a sense, the compact that established separate school education was an affirmative action program. In 1759, it was illegal to be a Roman Catholic in the British Empire. Roman Catholics could not hold public office and were subject to threat and imprisonment in 1759. In the middle of the 19th century, many Protestants spoke publicly of using public school education as a means of assimilating the Francophone population in Quebec and Ontario. With its various pronouncements from 1759 to 1841, the British Empire was not trying to win the loyalty of Catholics. It was trying to win the loyalty of Quebecois, who happened to be Catholic. I would say that the affirmative action program was either successful in its own right 
or its objectives have been achieved by other means. I do not believe that there is an anti-Catholic institutionalized prejudice in the country today. In any case, there's no justification for maintaining an affirmative action program at cost to the rights of others once its objective has been achieved. Now, some might make the argument that what began as an affirmative action program is now recognized by its beneficiaries as an essential manifestation of that human right which is known as freedom of religion. In that case, one would expect the Roman Catholic Church, which is passionate about social justice, to be arguing that what Catholics enjoy should be enjoyed as well by the people of other faiths, not only in Alberta, but everywhere across the country. And I don't hear that argument being made. The fourth argument for unification is that separate school education represents an entanglement of church and state. I favor the separation of church and state, which is the general direction in which our society is moving. Most provinces don't have a state church, but Alberta, along with Saskatchewan and Ontario, do have a state church. Such entanglement creates many practical problems for the provincial government, for the Alberta Teachers Association, for local governments, for citizens, and we can explore these in the conversation that will follow. Now, a moment ago, my first argument in favor of unification was that separate school education is contrary to the spirit of the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. This is not merely a conceptual argument. It has direct and negative implications for individual citizens. So my fifth argument is that separate school education compromises the charter rights of Canadians who have lost jobs in separate school systems on grounds that would be otherwise indefensible or who have been challenged in their attempts to start student clubs on grounds that would be otherwise indefensible or who have been denied the opportunity to stand for election as trustee of the system their child is enrolled with on grounds that would be otherwise indefensible. As the Constitution itself sets out with respect to charter rights, and I quote, the rights and freedoms set out herein subject only to such reasonable limits prescribed by law as can be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. In my view, separate school defenses of some of their practices would not succeed except for Section 29. Such defenses, when they are being made in the present time, could not be demonstrably justified in a free and democratic society. And because they could not be justified in the light of the Charter, separate schools must rely on Section 29. My sixth argument for unification is that the duplication of services and the fragmentation of communities is undesirable. From a strictly pragmatic perspective, Disestablishment would allow the community to redirect considerable resources away from administration and system support and toward the classroom and toward direct support for students. Disestablishment is not a money saver, but it is a money redirector to the benefit of students. The fragmentation of scarce resources causes fragmentation within communities, and those communities should be pulling together. My last two arguments <clears throat> are about education in a civil democratic society. I believe that a public school system should be a deliberate model of a civil democratic community. 
in that case, a public school system needs to be deliberately, consciously, and consistently inclusive without precondition of any kind. It needs to be inclusive in the classroom, on the playground, and in the governance system. It needs to treat inclusion as both a right and a responsibility. It needs to celebrate inclusion as the basis for diversity, and it needs to treat diversity as a strength to be cherished rather than as a weakness to be eradicated. Basically, I would like to see little Catholic kids sitting in the same classroom as little Jewish kids or little Indian kids. I'd like to see the rich and the poor and the newly arrived refugee in the same classroom. And I would like to see all of the parents of those students working in one system for the good of the education of all students. I believe in the old adage that it takes an entire village to raise a child. And the corollary of that, which all of us need to remember, is that the entire village then is responsible for the education of every child. Believing in democracy, <clears throat> I do not believe in subsidiarity, which is the organizational and operational basis of separate school education and the Catholic Church. Kevin Fian was for many years legal counsel of the Alberta Catholic School Trustees Association. In that role, Kevin wrote a regular column for the ACSTA periodical, The Catholic Dimension. In the fall 2008 issue, Kevin concluded a column with these words, and I quote, let Catholic education be separate, different, radical, and based upon a concept of education fundamentally opposed to that of the public school system, end quote. That is the role that separate school education sets for itself in Alberta. It starts with a preference for exclusion, with selective and limited inclusion to follow, at the discretion of the system, not the citizen. It works to be a deliberate model of a doctrinal faith community rather than a deliberate model of a civil democratic society. It is organized on the basis of subsidiarity rather than democracy. A strong and vital democracy should certainly be able to deal with such propositions but I see no reason why a democracy should privilege such propositions. It seems to me that the graduates of such a system must often have a pretty compromised view of the community's preference for inclusion and democracy. Let me close with one comment about capacity and one about legitimacy. I hope that I am not doing that to you, Ken. <laughs> <clears throat> the provincial government, essentially acting alone, can disestablish separate school education and unify the, the uh, systems. It has the capacity to amend the Constitution of Alberta. Indeed, the government of Alberta has amended the Constitution of Alberta. Procedurally, the way is quite straightforward. In the last 21 years, as I said earlier, Quebec has done away with separate school education, and so has Newfoundland and Labrador. It is probably correct to say that a Constitution should not change often or casually. On the other hand, if a community is to remain strong and vital in real time, sometimes constitutions need to change. There was a day when Alberta did not own the natural resources beneath its soil. There was a day when women did not have the right to vote. 
we can sometimes be thankful for constitutional change. It has been suggested that it would be, quote, wrong for the majority to terminate a constitutional right of a minority. My response is that we need to be very careful about what we mean when we use the word rights. Rights are not all of one kind, and Sophism has been used to cause confusion and uncertainty by conflating the different meanings of right. Not all constitutional rights are human rights. Many of them are deliverables of some political compromise or another. And the Constitution of Canada is full of such rights that are really constitutional deliverables. Why does Prince Edward Island have four seats in the House of Commons regardless of its population? The list of deliverables entrenched as rights in the Constitution, it's a lengthy list. And we need to be careful to separate rights that are deliverables from rights that are human rights. Such rights, those deliverables, have a limited shelf life. They only persist for as long as there is a strong sense that they are vital to the well-being of the Confederation. Our Federation will not founder, founder when Alberta unifies its two school systems. More significantly, sometimes the majority must protect the rights of a minority, even a minority of one. It is equally true and important that sometimes the majority must end the privilege of a significant minority. There was a day when only landowners could vote. They were privileged and the privilege ended. The end of the privilege was appropriate. There was a day when South Africa experienced separate but equal development. Whites were privileged and the privilege ended. The end of privilege was appropriate. In the context of justice, privilege is an injustice. We need the courage to look past what is politically correct in order to discern what is right. We need the courage to hear rhetoric and emotion without absorbing it or being cowed by it or responding to it in kind. We need to think deeply, speak carefully, and act faithfully in search of a better democracy with less privilege, more equity, and more justice for all. Thank you. Thank you very much, David, for a very strong pro side of the argument. And now for uh, the argument to the other side, Kent. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, I must tell you it's a pleasure to be here tonight. It took me 10.5 hours to fly from Calgary to Edmonton. <laughs> yes, these have been interesting days. I'd like to thank the Center for Constitutional Studies, and in particular its executive director, Pat Paradis, for asking me to be part of this important debate. Now, I have to say it is with a certain sense of trepidation that I am before you this evening, as I face, obviously, a formidable opponent, Mr. King, he is a man of many years of dedication to the people of Alberta in particular, its children as an MLA and Minister of Education, and in his work with the public school boards. It is little wonder that he's been honored by the government by having a school named after him. Well done, Mr. King. You can give a round. <laughs> Nevertheless, notwithstanding such a worthy opponent, I must engage him on this important topic. The onus, of course, is on Mr. King to show why Alberta should have one public school system. But I will speak in my 15 to 20 minutes in two parts. In part one, I will look at the genesis of Catholic separate schools, their purposes, and what they have achieved. 
And in part two, I will suggest why the current dual system of public education is preferable to a single system, and in doing so, I will address some of Mr. King's arguments in opposition. So let me begin then with part one. Why do separate schools exist, and what is their purpose? And how have they, how have they done in fulfilling what they think their purpose is? Well, simply put, their creation was necessary, for without this compromise between the English and the French in Canada in 1867, the Dominion of Canada would never have been created. As Prime Minister Tupper said, quote, without this compromise, the Dominion would not have been possible, end of quote. In Alberta and Saskatchewan, separate schools exist because there was a strong desire by Catholics, in particular French Catholics in the Northwest Territories, to protect their language, their culture, and religion through Catholic separate schools. Ottawa needed Quebec votes to pass the Saskatchewan and Alberta Acts of 1905, and hence we have Section 17 of the Alberta Act and the Saskatchewan Act, their duplicate sections. The protection of minority rights was acknowledged indeed, and that is what we find in Section 17. Again, in 1982, those rights were protected when Pierre Trudeau repatriated the Canadian Constitution. And under Section 29 of the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, the Charter will not usurp denominational rights. This was in the best of the Canadian tradition, whereby the rights of minorities are respected and protected from what the Supreme Court of Canada has in several cases called the tyranny of the majority. In any democratic state, there is any democratic state that is free and seeks fairness and justice for all, minorities must respect, or majorities rather, must respect the rights of minorities under law, but also, so I would argue, for moral reasons. Too often history in, uh, of majorities have wiped out minority rights or simply refused to acknowledge them, claiming the voice of the majority is wisest and all must succumb to that legislative power. The incarceration of the Japanese Canadians in World War II the eugenics legislation passed by the Alberta government to sterilize the unfit Albertans, the criminalization of homosexual acts are good examples of the power of the majority, are good examples of the power of that majority when it goes amok. It's also important to remember this, that usually when those arguments are made, one has the sense of the speaker using us as an our as opposed to you and us together. You may ask, what is the purpose of Catholic separate schools? So let's take a look at that. One purpose of separate schools is to teach children about their creator and what is expected of his children. And secondarily, to nurture students to become involved citizens in the body politic, critical of the politic, well-educated to participate in trades and professions according to their natural gifts. Documents which speak of that philosophy of Catholic schools, there are many. In the Catholic school system, we know of one called the by the Congregation for Catholic Education, which speaks specifically of the Catholic school and says, quote, the Catholic school offers to itself to all, non-Christians included, with all of its distinctive aims and goals, acknowledging, preserving, and promoting the spiritual and moral qualities, the social and cultural values which characterize different civilizations. In 1988, that same congregation stated, the religious freedom and the personal conscience of individual students and their families in Catholic schools must be respected. To summarize, the Catholic Church invites everyone to dialogue about their faith, whatever it may be, and their beliefs in an atmosphere of freedom of conscience and religion in the Catholic school. Perhaps, perhaps, this is why the Alberta Council for Religious Freedom, with members from the Muslim community, the Sikh community, the Jewish community, the Christian community, and the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints have expressed their support for publicly funded, constitutionally protected Catholic separate schools. Perhaps this is also why non-Catholics have flocked to Catholic separate schools. In Saskatchewan, we estimate that there could be any, as high as 25 to 30 percent of non-Catholics in Catholic schools. In downtown Toronto, we know of a Catholic school where there are 32 percent of the students being Islamic students. You see, they feel comfortable in a Catholic school. They find a home where their freedom of conscience and their religion is safe. They find a deep and abiding respect for their religious beliefs, whatever they may be, expressed by the teachers and the administrators in those schools because they too have a spiritual mission, religiously based. Indeed, in Catholic schools in Great Britain, prayer rooms are set aside for Islamic students. Catholic separate schools respect the sincerity and importance of all beliefs. That's inclusion. 
How many students attend Catholic separate schools in Alberta? That's a good question. Well, the exact number is 168,629. That translates roughly into 112,000 families, Albertan families, who have chosen Catholic separate schools for their children. 26% of Albertans, 26 of them, percent of them, include, uh, are, are, have chose, chosen Catholic, school, ca Catholic schools. What does the evidence show about Alberta's Catholic separate schools? What does the evidence say? It says that they're growing. They represent, as I say, 26% of the province's students. They support and care meaningly, meaningfully for their non-Catholic students, such as evidence from my study, and I've been working in this since 1998 in Alberta and Saskatchewan, talking to non-Catholic students, talking to their parents, doing research on it, finding out what they really think, what they feel, why do they come here? Is it just because the school is closer to where they live? In some cases, yes, but not generally. They are supported by a wide variety of Christian and non-Christian faith groups. Catholic schools are. Evidence by gain by the Alberta Council for Religious Freedom, where, by the way, I sit as a board member. So I speak with a certain amount of authority as what that board and what that group has said. In research done by the Alberta Ministry comparing the separate and the public systems in Edmonton and Calgary, the four primary urban center, uh, uh, school districts, Edmonton Catholic scores first in parental involvement, in citizenship development, in work and program of studies. Calgary Catholic scores first, having the lowest student dropout rate, the highest rate in high school completion, as well as in other areas, including the transition rate from school to post-secondary studies. Calgary Catholic ranks second of four in the Provincial Safe and Caring School Index, and second of the fourth in parental involvement. Alberta's Catholic separate schools are doing an exemplary job of educating Alberta's students. Can more be done? Well, absolutely. And they strive to do so. But make no mistake, the public school system within it is also excellent. And their teachers are committed. And their, te and their administrators are committed. I taught in the, in the public school system. Those teachers are every bit as excellent as the ones in the, in, the, in the Catholic separate school system. I have a great admiration for my colleagues in both. This is an exciting time to talk about this important work of education for Albertans. But you may ask, that's a pretty rosy picture, Don Levy. But what about Mr. King's concerns? And that's a fair question. So let's turn to those. Mr. King says Catholic separate schools, they represent a state church connection that favors one denomination in a way that, den that is denied to every other denomination. Really? Consider the support of the Alberta Council of Religious Freedom, which supports Catholic separate schools as it recognizes the power of the state, and this is an important issue, the power of the state in attempting to interfere with Catholic education today can be turned upon them tomorrow. So an attempt to, by some to pit one religious group against another for whatever purposes, perhaps political, that is just not going to work. Non-Catholics have voted on this issue with their feet and they come to Catholic separate schools. And secondly, Mr. King has argued that $60 million in public funds could be saved by, by combining the systems, really. Or he talks about a reallocation of funds. Let's look at that. To the public schools, let us add another 168,629 students. Add it in. Let's put all the teachers in now. Oh, let's put the school administrators in, or at least some of them. And other costs necessitated by these extra bodies. And the $60 million number is pure, with all due respect, fantasy. In business, this is called fluff, to get the customer in the door to buy the goods. My comment is, beware of the business that acts in this fashion. But what of economics of scale and duplicated services? There are already, there are already in Alberta shared facilities, St. Thomas Aquinas and Black Gold Beaumont, and shared busing agreements between the systems. An example is Evergreen Catholic, Parkland County, Grand Yellowhead, Black Gold, Wild Rose. In fact, I believe that with two exceptions, all boards have shared busing agreements. There are shared agreements as well for bulk purchasing, IT arrangements, Agreements with municipalities for shared facilities use. Agreed agreements for sports complexes. Shared agreements to share speech therapists and a, an occupational therapist. Mr. King, where is your $60 million of savings? Mr. King, where is the cost savings? Where, is, where are these economies of scale? Where is your centralized school administration? The total expenditures for Alberta education in 2015 and 16, by the audited financial statements, $7.5 billion. If we take just 10%, uh, what Mr. King has estimated savings might be, or reallocated, by joining the systems, it would save 
Eight one hundredths of one percent of the $7.5 billion budget. That is akin to saving 80 cents on $1,000. But at what cost? Disrupt at what cost? Disrupting an excellent service recognized as such by the ministry's assessments itself and throwing into chaos the education of 168,629 students and causing stress to their parents. Approximately 112,000 families and innumerable teachers and school administrators, we have to remember they have lives too, also, to raise the issue of the abrogation of separate schools would put Al pit Albertans against Albertans in a public battle. No real benefit to Albertans. To do so would simply raise the bigotry and enmity of gone by days, doing precisely what Mr. King says he would not wish to do, which is fragment this Albertan community. Mr. King makes other arguments. He would have us believe that the Catholic separate school is a privilege. It's a privilege. It's not right and contends that it is the same category as apartheid in South Africa and women not having the vote in Canada as in the past. Mr. King says that a right is for all, not some, and so it is time to remove the privilege. Mr. King, with all due respect, is an error. Canadians accept that a right may only favor some, not all Canadians. Let's look at section 15 of the Charter, which talks about non-discrimination. Should we tell the LGBTQ community in Alberta that you have a privilege, not a right? I think not. I think not. Well, a right requires a specific legal process to diminish or abrogate it. A legal privilege requires no such action. Catholic separate schools have a legal right, not a privilege. Mr. King said on October 27th of 2017 the following, quote, when kids go through systems which are exclusive and do not have a felt need to model a civil democratic community, what is going to be their attitude and how are they going to function as adults in a civil democratic community? With all due respect, if there was ever a dog whistle to the worst elements of society, here it is. The claim by a former Minister of Education for Alberta that Catholic separate schools are unable and unwilling to nurture their students in how to fully participate in Canadian society. In May 2011, Mr. King said that, quote, public education exists to create a particular kind of community a civil democratic community, and separate school systems don't exist to create and sustain a civil democratic community. They exist to create and sustain a faith community. Apparently, Mr. King does not believe that one can walk and chew gum at the same time. In any event, inherent to a Catholic faith community is the social doctrine of that church which does not ask, it demands that those in the education community participate in both civilly and democratically structured, civil and democratic structures. Oh, it's possible that one would say that non-Catholics cannot elect a trustee. That's true. That's true. Non-Catholic parents in Catholic schools are not allowed to become trustees nor to elect them. Well, there's always a restriction when you make choices. But to say that non-Catholics do not have a large voice in schools from my research of almost 20 years would not be correct. Non-Catholics have a huge voice to express their favor or disfavor as to what happens in their schools. And they can move, of course, with the loudest voice of all from the Catholic system into a public school system. So given this theoretical problem, where is Mr. King's evidence to show the dissatisfaction with the current situation? Where's the evidence? Is there contrary evidence? I would suggest that there is. Non-Catholics continue to flock to Catholic separate schools. People vote with their feet, and, their, and in doing so, that argument provided by my dear friend fails. As a side note, by the way, Harvard University did a recent quantita qualita quantitative study on, quote, the effects of Catholic schooling on, civil, on civic participation. Let me say it again. The effects of Catholic schooling on civic participation. It found that students who attended Catholic schools are substantially more likely to vote the author stated this, quote, the evidence is highly suggestive that Catholic schools are actually better than public schools at promoting adult civic participation. Better. I'm not saying that that's the case in Alberta, but I'm simply saying that is the test done in the United States over with many, many, many thousands of Catholic schools and public schools. But Mr. King has argued that the Canadian civil, that Canadian civil rights and human rights thinking have changed 
since the 1800s, and that separate school boards are based on old thinking about human rights and civil rights that undermines our current approach. Note the use of the word our, the expressed need to make it us, them. So common in such talk. Look not to 1867, rather to 1982, and March 19th of 2015. Why? Because at that time, the Supreme Court of Canada in the Loyola case held that religious rights in a Catholic school trumped Quebec's provincial government's attempt to trample on that right. It's been said that this is old thinking. It's the very ba yet that old thinking is the very basis for all of our fundamental rights as Canadians. Yes, constitutional change is possible. I have no argument with Mr. King's process with regard to a constitutional change. That is the law. But consider, so is it also with the rights of First Nations and French Canadians if we go changing the Constitution. But we're told that one only wants a referendum to let the people of Alberta decide the issue. We're told that having two systems divides Albertans, really. More so than comparing the legal nature of the rights of Catholic separate schools to those of apartheid in a vicious, brutal, evil South African regime which oppressed its people or with the statement fearing that Catholic schools will turn out adults not able to function in a civil society using such incendiary language inflames old entities and simply is not reasonable to use. All of this, all of this is extremely unfortunate language to use in such an argument before the uh, people of Alberta. We're told that Alberta communities are being stressed in res resources and we should encourage unifying, unifying conditions in our communities, not encouraging fragmentation. Well, what I've just talked about are hardly unifying words. The argument on the other side has raised old canards from the distant past, from what we call, although it's been said, Catholics are no longer discriminated against. But we've heard the arguments, which are really particularly against offensive to Catholics, such as Catholic schools teach religion, not the wider societal values. Catholic schools are not inclusive. Really? The argument is made about GSAs, uh, Gay Straight Alliances, that they're not. Go to Bishop Carroll. For three years, they've had one of those particular clubs, there are at least 11 in, in Calgary Catholic. Catholic adults who graduate from Catholic schools cannot be trusted to be, if you will, citizens, fully participating. Yeah, we yeah, can't really trust them. Catholic schools divide children by their face. Catholics are just motivated to keep their privileges from others. It's a power thing, you see. Or Catholic schools are divisive in a society. To these, one can add that, as Mr. King says, he was prepared his words, 30% of funding for Catholic schools should be about right, because that's really what they contribute to the public good. His words, not mine. You can listen to the podcast. Mr. King, these egregious, inflammatory, and simply untrue statements are not worthy of you as a former minister of education, not worthy of a man of your reputation and a man of your stature. Catholic separate schools, their teachers, administrators, and trustees have the best interests of Alberta's Catholic children in mind and have dedicated their lives to the psychological, the social, the intellectual, the physical, and the spiritual development of every child. They are driven by that objective and motivated by the love of Jesus Christ and his admonition to those who tried to keep children from him when he said, suffer little children and forbid them not to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. This resolution seeks to solve pedagogical, financial, and social problems which in fact do not exist in Alberta, and the, rise, and the raising of which will simply awaken bigotry, sectarianism, and divide Albertans at a time when now more than ever we must be a community, respecting freedom of religion and conscience, and not a society seeking to put all under the monolith of one system claiming one set of values as best, and it's ours. There's only one best way to education, and it's ours. One way for all, our way, we know what's best for you. This is the odious, dangerous 20th century myth, reborn again. We had hoped had been buried long ago, but here it is raising its ugly monolithic head again. Arrogance. I say to you, my friends, and if I may say brothers and sisters, this resolution cannot stand. So now we'll just have a nice, polite conversation <laughs> between the two of you, I hope. Absolutely. You have till 6.30. Till 6.30? Okay. Five to 
when an Irish academic is in full flight, <laughs> it, uh, it is very difficult to keep up. Um, I, uh, <clears throat> I found Dr. Don Levy's comments very interesting. I will have to watch the videotape three or four times to get down all the notes I would want to get down. Um, I, I think, I don't know where to start in terms of asking questions. <laughs> um, there's no question that separate school education has done a very fine job of educating many, many students for many, many years. I don't think this is about the quality of the education that is being offered. Um, my wife taught in a separate school for 35 years and uh, enjoyed every single day of it. And I would like to think that she contributed to the good education of many students. Uh, to my way of thinking, Dr. Don Levy's comments were about instrumentality rather than the framework of the nation. And so I'd ask, for example, Dr. Don Levy, you, you referred to the 2012 case, the Loyola case. Am I correct that Loyola was a private school in Quebec and not a denominational school? That's correct. Yeah. So the decision of the court is somewhat different for a private school than it is for a denominational school in Quebec. Well, I, th I think what the important thing to remember is this. Uh, you had mentioned earlier that we have a quite, separate school rights or collective rights or group rights. They're not individual human rights. The difficulty with that argument is this, that contained within that collective right are all, and this is what the Supreme Court said, all of those individuals have the right to freedom of conscience and freedom of religion. The institution might very well have that same right. In Loyola, what we have is the individuals, the court says, there is a, all of those individuals have the right to freedom of conscience and freedom of religion, and that this may very well be either collectively a, a corporate right or not. Now, I think that it's, um, it's pretty clear that it leaves open the argument. I'm not saying that this is determined, but I am saying it does leave open the argument that a Catholic separate school would have that same collective right as would a particular hospital that had a particular religious view. And uh, so I think Loyola would apply. It certainly would be argued, but I think that neither you or I will settle that today. But it would be wrong just to say collective rights are not human rights because it's contained within that collective right are the individual human rights of the individuals who are saying, I have the right to freedom of conscience, freedom of religion, the right not to be discriminated against for my religion or whatever it may be. So it's a little more complicated than, than, than I think that it was represented. I guess the only question I would ask is whether or not Loyola is perhaps a red herring in our conversation today, uh, given that it was not about Section 29 and it wasn't about separate school education. It was about the charter rights in the first section of the Constitution. And I come then to a second point you made that individual religious rights would be at risk if separate school education was done away with. Uh, is it not correct that uh, Section 29 would maintain the religious freedom rights of Albertans, notwithstanding any decision by Alberta to do away with separate school education. Doing away with separate school education would not compromise the religious freedom rights in the Charter, and it wouldn't compromise the operation of Section 29, would it? Well, the difficulty is this, is that I think you're trying to pair, uh, your, your, your approach is, is not one that I would recognize as being a legal approach. Um, if Alberta were to merge the two school systems together, and by way of constitutional amendment, and that could be done, and I, I agree with your analysis on that, that's pretty clear. Um, the, and by the way, I did, in case I didn't mention to you, 70% of the people in Alberta, and I'm sure you've seen the Angus Reid poll, 70% agree that there should be funding for religious schools. Um, individual human rights would still exist, but the collective right to form separate schools, whether it would be Catholic or not Catholic separate schools, because it could be both, uh, simply would be gone in the province. That, that would be sure. 
Would an individual have individual human uh, individual rights? Yes, but the difficulty is you lose. Well, let me put it to you this way: You have a family. You can be out there by. We all know people who live alone, and it's lonely. The idea of a human right, the right to freedom of religion and freedom of conscience in particular, it means really nothing unless you have someone you can talk to, someone that you just like in a family. So one of the things that, that the Supreme Court has recognized is that it's, whether it's Loyola or whether it's certain other areas, those, those, the, to have freedom of conscience and freedom of religion means you have to have a corporation, a company, or some kind of a society or a group. And we've been fortunate enough in Canada, at least in Alberta, for sure, in Saskatchewan, Ontario, to do that. To sure. It's very, we've been fortunate enough to be able to say that we can protect those communities. And one of the critical things with separate schools here is that we're able to protect the Catholic community and now 25, maybe even higher, of non-Catholics who are coming in to share the belief of religious schools. You see, let me give you an example of what's happened in Alberta. A public school district has attached to it an Islamic school. They do in Fort McMurray, they do here. They may have a Christian school as they attach to a public school system. But then the government passes a law, and the law requires that that Christian school or Islamic school has to abide by the law of the province as it should, but they have to, they cannot do so, they can't even fight it if they stay within the public school system, so they have to withdraw from it and go back to being their own particular uh, individual school. We don't have that problem with, with separate schools, separate Catholic schools, because we have a constitutional protection. This is why my friends in the Sikh community are very concerned. They see us as being the bastion, the protection, whereby we can actually come up against the government and say, well, there's a constitutional right because religion can be protected. They see us as holding the flag, if you will. That's why the people I talk to, and there's quite a few people in this particular group that I'm involved in from a variety of faiths, that's why they say to me, we will help you defend Catholic separate schools constitutionally protected. We don't want to have the state to have the right to say that all religious schools are going to teach this particular thing. We'd like to know that we have some friends within, within Alberta who are protected from the government. I, I mean, I appreciate the fact you've been a minister and you've been a part of the government. It's just that I don't particularly trust the government for uh, everything to make all the decisions. I don't know if anybody else does. It's, it's, nice, it's nice to be able to say to the government every once in a while, stop, right? And it's also nice to be able to say when we talk about collective rights, as did Brad Wall, no, I'm going to invoke Section 33 of the Charter. And he did. So there's... I don't put all my faith in government. Certainly not issues, on issues of religion and freedom of conscience. But I have a question I'm, for you. Is I'm, that right? I'm glad. <laughs> I'm glad. <laughs> Mr. King, I mean, I said at the very beginning, you're, 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 you are a man of high reputation. I mean, I, I accept that, and I acknowledge that. And you've been honored, and you should be honored, because of the many, many years you put in the care and, and uh, development for, uh, of children in the province. And I, I really respect you for that, sir. What I don't understand is the vociferousness against Catholic separate schools. Like, what really, truly, do you see as the core, the core issue for you? You mentioned a whole bunch of things. Can we focus in on, give us one or two? There are a number, but uh, the first two that come to mind are, as I say, that it is a privilege. Um, there is a level of support that is available to Roman Catholic separate schools that is not available to Christian schools. I've got friends here who are deeply engaged with Christian schools, uh, Jewish schools, or Sikh schools. Um, I tend to believe that there should be a level playing field. And quite clearly, the playing field is not level as among the various denominations and faiths in Alberta. So that's one concern that I have. The second concern that I have is genuinely that I am concerned about the public in Alberta as a whole. I'm, I'm concerned about the way the public is being fragmented, and this is a serious political problem. Uh, so I tend to go to the idea 
uh, that public school education should function as a deliberate model of a civil democratic society and be inclusive. It's true that separate schools enroll many, many thousands of students who are not Catholic, but we need all to remember, and, and you alluded to it, that they're there at the sufferance of the separate school board. They're not there as a matter of right. There is a difference between inclusion that is granted by others and inclusion that is available to me as a right. And as you say, <clears throat> you could be high Anglican or Lutheran, you could be engaged in RCIA with the intent of becoming Catholic, but if at a moment in time you are not Catholic, though you enroll your five kids in the separate school, you can't vote for the trustees who are educating your children. Um, these are issues that concern me greatly. And you cast a pretty black pall over what might be the outcome of unification. I don't accept that it would throw the, the education of children into chaos. I don't accept that it would awaken historic religious antagonisms. It's happened twice, in Quebec and in Newfoundland and Labrador. The evidence, and it's limited, I admit this, the evidence is that in 1997, in some small communities that were predominantly Roman Catholic, 75% of the population voted in favor of unification. I think you'd be hard pressed to find that in Newfoundland and Labrador, or in Quebec, that 20 years after unification, the provinces are riven by religious tension that is the result of having created unifi unified systems. That, that's a fair point uh, or two, so let me just address them quickly. Uh, in the first case, uh, a level playing field. Level playing field, and then the other side, you know, we're all grown-ups, you can choose where you want to go to school. There's a certain amount of choice involved here, and acceptance of what the results are if you exercise that choice. We do that as, as citizens. The other point is this, if you remove the bastion of religious education in the province, constitutionally protected, there's no religious organization constitutionally protected in the province. You have it individually, but you don't have it collectively. That's a major issue. The second thing is that uh, I paint a dark picture. Well, I'm not saying we're going back to the 1920s when the Ku Klux Klan was in Alberta and Saskatchewan, and they used to burn crosses in front of St. Paul's school, where I went to school, in Saskatoon. Uh, I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that you will have people in, in communities in Alberta who are going to simply say, well, Let's, 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 let's have this, not this civil discussion, but let's have a real argument about it, and people will. I think as I was coming in here, I was talking to some people, and they said, this is a pretty hot issue. People get really incensed about it, and let's have civil discussion if that's possible. So I think that those old enmities, the arguments that in any way would suggest that the education that's provided in a separate school is less in any way in production in helping people become citizens is to me, well, quite frankly, offensive, as it would be, I think, if I said it about the public school system. So those are the difficulties. I don't, you and I would agree, I think we can, at least we have to turn this over to the audience, but I think we can agree on one thing, and that is this. Whether you are in the public school system or the separate school system, these are people who are very dedicated, very professional, people who care greatly about students, and work toward the common good of making a better place for these children and a better Alberta for them to grow up in. I think we can agree on that, can we not? Very good, we should turn it over to the audience. Is it on, Larry? Yeah. So uh, what we'd like you to do, if you would, please, and I know this is not always a comfortable thing to do, but if you would come to the two stand-up mics we have here to ask your questions, we'd really appreciate it, simply because we'd like to get all of your questions on tape, if possible. So if you have a question, if you could please come. The other thing I'd like to just ask you, if, if please, um, is to try to keep your uh, questions to questions, not further uh, speeches. Uh, 
I got that from Paula Simons. Uh, but anyway, just so that we can give the, the most number of people a chance to, to ask questions uh, as possible. And just so you are aware, we will stop the questions at about three minutes to seven so that we can bring the evening to a close. So um, we'll begin on the right-hand side and then... How do we do that? <laughs> it's, a, it's a really important topic. I was looking forward very much to a thoughtful discussion of such a, an important issue. And, and I, I have to say that I'm a little bit disappointed. I, I heard, I think, half of a thoughtful discussion, but I'm, I'm, I, I'm going to direct my question to Dr. Don Levy, and there are really two questions. And one is why you would take the tack of... I think an approach that, unlike Mr. King's approach, which was very, I think, focused on principles, uh, there was a lot of emotion and rhetoric and polemics, I think. I, I, I guess I was disappointed in the arguments you put forward and the use of language. And I guess I, I'd want to know why you would use terms of incendiary, egregious, inflammatory, odious, dangerous, arrogance, vociferous, and offensive. And so if I could ask you not to deal with that right now, but instead to focus on one very key point that he raised, and that was, we're not facing, it seems to me, by having this important discussion and by opening it up, we're not facing chaos. And I think the two examples that he raised of Quebec and Newfoundland, where things worked out, people discussed it civilly, they came to a conclusion, and they moved on. So, so I guess without the rhetoric and the emotion, could you address that specific question, please? Because it's a very important part of the, of the arguments. Thank you. Well, I'm, gonna, I'm going to leave aside uh, your particular commentary on uh, how I approach things. But I will say this, there's no doubt in my mind that uh, what happened in, I mean, what happened in Newfoundland was very painful, very destructive to certain parts of the communities. I've talked to my, uh, several of my friends who were there at the time. It was not as easy as you would suggest it. Um, Quebec has gone through, I would think people would, would, would agree that Quebec is a very unique situation, having gone through the, the, the revolution that it did. In Alberta, my concern would be this is that if you are going to now have to decide on physical properties and where these children are going to go, and about teachers who are no longer employed in the Catholic school system, who's going to be employed in the public school system, uh, you're going to encounter the same kind of problem as Brad Wall foresaw taking place as a result of the Theodore decision in Saskatchewan and was necessary to invoke the, uh, invoke the charter, section 33. So my point is this. Why would you even, even if I accept your point, which, or Mr. King's point, perhaps, that it would not take place? Why would one do that? Why would, there has to be a very good reason to make forward, to go forward with those things as being possible. My druthers would be that there is no reasonable reason to do that. That's my position. You. You're welcome. Yes, ma'am. Uh, Dr. Donnelly, I'd like to direct my question to you. You mentioned... You, you mentioned as part of your argument, you painted this picture where people are going to Catholic schools because of choice, this, this very perfect world where a person is allowed to attend whichever school they like to. And in Alberta and many communities, that's not the reality. There are some communities where the only choice that Edmonton, not in Edmonton, in Morinville, there was no choice of a public school. There are communities in Edmonton where the public schools are so full that some parents are having last minute conversions the day before kindergarten starts converting to Catholicism so they can simply get their child into a school in their own community. They're not making that as a choice, it's what they have to do. And you use the argument that so many non-Catholics are choosing to attend Catholic schools as a way to support your version of a Catholic school as a wonderful place that people are choosing, but I'm wondering if you have any numbers of how many Catholic parents are choosing to send their children to public school. I don't do research on that. Whoa, that's, that's a hot mic. I don't do research on that, uh, but I know as a fact uh, there are many Catholics, 
who don't support Catholic separate schools. I mean, that's just a fact. They, they, don't, they call themselves Catholic, but they don't support the Catholic Church and some of the, some of the particular social positions of the Catholic Church. I haven't done research on it, but I certainly will acknowledge that that is the case. Um, anyone who has had a, as a child, had a difficult experience in a Catholic school uh, may very well have second thoughts about whether or not he or she wants to send their children there for whatever reason. Um, so those, I, those exist. Uh, I do not know the facts and the figures of that, and nor do I know if anyone has done any research on it. I'd be very interested to know uh, if anyone has. I haven't seen any. Okay, thank you. And by the way, Morinville was a mess, <laughs> for sure. It was a disgrace. Thank you. Good evening. This is a question for you, Dr. Don Levy. Uh, <clears throat> And it's a specific question. You had indicated a lot of different statistics about, you know, the two different systems here. Now, there was also an acknowledgement that a number of the pro other provinces in Canada have gone into one education system. That's, correct. That's in Canada. That we're talking about the same country here. At least I think at this time we are. Now, the question comes up here. You did not have any kind of statistics in regards to the overall success or failures of all this mass changes. And the thing that I'm not aware of that's not hitting the news in any major ways and is rebellions and whatever else between you know, the, the Catholics and the uh, public school. And I was wondering if, if it's not being advertised that, is it working okay perhaps that we're not using those statistics or how come we don't have more information on that? Could I ask you to re-articulate that question? To repeat the question? Well, the question I'm comes a little, up. Yes, a little bit, please. The question comes up here in terms of the lack of statistics that you had here to basically get some idea as to what's happening in the other provinces compared to Alberta in regards to the success or the failure of an amalgamated system. I don't think there's. I don't know of anybody who has criticized uh, the. Uh, the, the, the end of denominational schools in Newfoundland Labrador. I don't know if anyone has criticized that other than the people who, who uh, uh, have lost their, their, the, the school that they used to go to. Um, as far as I know, there's no large uproar in, in Quebec as well, in, in either of those. So to the best of my knowledge, I haven't seen anything that's taken place. That, those are the end results. The issue is what takes place as you move through getting there? Is it worth that price? Because people don't talk to each other, families break up, families get in terrible arguments. That was my point. But I would agree with you that I haven't seen any statistics. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Dr. Don Levy, oh I've my got. Goodness. But I'm going to ask uh, Mr. King to respond to this as well to make it a little fair. I've got two, maybe 2.5 questions for you that I, I will say quickly. You, you seem to skate a little over Mr. King's argument about the rights of, of non Catholics to vote. Uh, in, in your discussion, because I know you would never ask anyone in this audience, and I, you would never argue, that a municipality in Alberta that didn't allow women to vote would somehow be acceptable, even though the women decided to stay there. So why, just because people stay in the Catholic system, even though they're not allowed to vote, are we expected to accept that? Uh, the sec and, and, and the second quick question is, does your analysis factor in the privilege state of Catholic schools is why other religious minorities choose to send them there, because there isn't an equality of other religions in terms of education. Well, let me see if I can understand your question. Your first question is, merely because someone chooses to go into a Catholic school and, 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 okay, and doesn't have the right to vote, uh, how, I think your point is, how can that be just? Mm -hmm. Is that about right? Yeah. Well, a lot of things aren't just. I mean, the point is you make the choice. And no, that, no, it's no, the no, choice. no, 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 no
Now, the denominational aspect is the Supreme Court of Canada. That's not me talking. And the only way you do that is to have them there. If I could make, if I could make a quick comment about this, because it raises an important point. The Catholic Church could not change that circumstance if it wanted to, because it's really important to remember that separate schools do not belong to the Catholic Church. They are a civil institution. What makes them unique is that their electorate is entirely Roman Catholic, but they're created by civil law, they're funded by tax money from all Albertans, okay? the schools are owned by the provincial government, okay? The, the separate school system is an entirely civil institution. It has no legal obligation to the bishop. The bishop has no financial responsibility for separate schools. Okay? Um, and we need to keep that in mind. So, if someone were to say, other than Catholics could vote in a trustee election, it would be the provincial government that would say it, not the church. Actually, if I may just correct that a little bit. Uh, because Catholic separate schools uh, are bound by law, they're required in certain instances to make determinations based upon the denominational aspects of the school. For example, if a teacher does not act according to the principles of the Catholic faith, and that, that person, if that teacher is a Catholic, then the person can be dismissed for denominational cause. Well, where do you find out what exactly is involved in these denominational aspects? Well, you don't go to the government for it. You go to case law, but you also bring in the expert who can sit in front of a judge and say, these are the denominational aspects of it. So it, it's a, it's, um, it would be incorrect to say that, that all they are is an entity created by, by statute that has no uh, relationship whatsoever to the ecclesial, ecclesiastical body of the church. It's simply, that would simply be not correct. Because core of it is the denominational aspect, which has to be determined by denominational experts. And if I could make a quick rejoinder, the fact that separate schools claim that association with the magisterium, and the fact that they have argued it using section 29 of the charter, does not necessarily mean that it is the case. And it furthers the argument that we should unify the systems so as to get past the exemption that is available by Section 29. Oh, except the Supreme Court says it is. The Supreme Court says it is. Thank you to the Center of Constitutional Studies for hosting this event. I think we're very blessed in Canada to have a place where we can have a heated discussion and debate without political violence. So uh, thank you for that. So I'll uh, switch things over to Mr. King, just to even things out a little bit here. Um, you spoke very uh, politically and philosophically. Um, one thing I, as a, a professor, I, I'd like to hear more of is just empirical data, because you, you did make statements uh, that other faiths do not enjoy the same privilege as Catholic schools. You made uh, comments about uh, the uh, entanglement of church and state, and that this creates havoc and issues, and I, I didn't hear any empirical support for those, uh, for those important comments. So if you could please comment on that, thank you. Sure. Um, if we start with the first one, that privilege for one denomination carries associated relative disadvantage for other denominations. Um, any denomination in Alberta can start a private school, and they do. Uh, but uh, they do not have the right to create a Lutheran electorate for a Lutheran private school. They don't enjoy tax support. They get grants from the provincial government, and those grants are significantly less than the financial assistance available to a public school. Um, I think that at the present time, provincial government financial support for religious private schools is about 70% of the operating cost of um, separate schools or public schools, and they get no support, as far as I know, for capital cost. Uh, so that may have changed in the last few years. Uh, so there are those kinds of situations. And of course, those private schools, if they are Christian Reformed or Jewish, 
are organized as societies under the Societies Act. They're not um, under the School Act. There are other examples that I could offer, but we're getting uh, close to the end of the time, and I have by now forgotten what was the second element. <laughs> Oh, yes, entanglement. Uh, well, uh, I think that there are a number, and you asked for empirical evidence. I'm not sure that anti anecdotal evidence qualifies as empirical, but you can see the problem that has uh, arisen in the last couple of years over the establishment of gay-straight alliances in high schools. Uh, you can see the decision of the Bishop of Calgary a few years ago uh, that he did not want the separate schools in Calgary uh, to be sites for the administration of the HPV vaccine. Uh, you can see the uh, uh, insistence of the ACSTA uh, that they do not want uh, shared facilities unless there is an intervening community facility. Uh, they do not want to share libraries, for example. Um, so I think that the provincial government and the Alberta Teachers Association experience entanglements that are problematic. And in, as far as the government is concerned, I think it goes beyond education into other aspects of public policy. You and I should have a beer afterwards and, and carry on this conversation. Um, just a, a couple of quick clarifications. The uh, study that was brought up earlier, the Angus Reid poll that was published earlier this year said that 57% of Albertans said that they believed the Catholic school system here should not continue to receive full funding or should get no funding, 57%. Um, no, that's factually correct. Um, the second thing is, if you are Sikh or Mormon and you want your child uh, to receive a Sikh or Mormon uh, education here, um, you will miss out on about quarter of a million uh, public tax dollars if you have three children. Catholic families with three children are favoured to the tune of about quarter of a million dollars over the period of those three children's education. Um, my question is this, to run through some Facts very quickly. Uh, the judge in Saskatchewan said that the intent of Catholic schools was not to receive public funding. Taxes, here in Alberta, the average public student receives $4,000 in directed public taxes. The uh, Catholic student receives less than 1500 So that means that non-Catholics stump up $400 million a year just to bring up the shortfall in Catholic directed property taxes, is it then a fair statement, Mr. King, to say that today's Catholic school system is more separate from the original environment and intent and agreement that it's set up under, and yet not very separate from my wallet? I can agree with that. <laughs> Let me just uh, point out that I have the uh, actual uh, poll in front of me done by uh, my cousin, Angus Reid, actually. And uh, <clears throat> full funding equal to support of the public schools in Alberta, 43%. Partial funding, 27%. So I would say to me that 70% of the people in Alberta would like to see at least some funding going toward the separate schools. Now, uh, this is, uh, I'll leave this up to you to, 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 to look at. But uh, we're almost out of time, Pat. But I'm going to suggest that because this is a factual matter, people can check yeah, and, can. and move on to the next sure. question. And, and, and by the way, just before you go, uh, uh, it is, we are just about two minutes to seven. And I'm wondering, given the number of people who still want to speak, if people would be willing to stay another 10 minutes. Is that, yes, okay. And what about our two debaters? The well, debaters. All for me. Oh. <laughs> All right, thank you. So, so we'll go till 10 after 7, if that's all right with everyone. Okay. Question to Mr. King. Uh, good. We'll continue a discussion that we started, I think, in high school classrooms uh, back in the 60s, if I'm not mistaken, David. 
But anyway, the question is, um, I hear you basically arguing for disestablishment um, because of the fact that you support the notion of separation of, of, of state and church. Um, but is, doesn't your argument then sort of move towards saying, okay, we don't want to have a special privilege for Catholics, and so the way we deal with that is by having one single public school system. But then, in a sense, what you're doing there is establishing the state as, a, as the primary uh, player in setting the, the policies, the directions, the, the tone the, the, of, of schooling. And schooling is inherently a value-laden enterprise um, and, and so why should the state have the dominant one? So why not use your perspective and say, uh, instead of taking this right away from one particular religious or ideological group, let's open it up and let a thousand flowers bloom and let everyone uh, have an opportunity in a pluralistic society to be able to educate their children um, in, in a particular faith or other ideological perspective, as say happens in the country of my birth, the Netherlands. I think a thousand flowers should bloom. Okay. Um, and we're, we're getting into something that takes me to my concept of politics and beyond the realm of separate school education. Okay. First of all, having said that I believe in the separation of church and state, I am equally strong in my conviction that that does not lead us to the separation of faith from community. Okay. I said that I think the school, the public school, should be a deliberate, consistent model of a civil democratic community. In civil democratic communities, adults walk around wearing crucifixes, okay, uh, or yarmulkes. The public school has not done a good job of, on the one hand, respecting the role of personal faith without using this as a platform to proselytize. Okay? So I think the public school system has work to do in that situation. I do not believe that public schools should start the day with the, with the Lord's Prayer. But I do accept quite easily that you might give every child a card and say we're going to have 90 seconds of silence first thing in the morning and I do not care whether it's the Lord's Prayer or a Sikh prayer or a Jewish prayer I don't care if you think about your relationship with nature. So let me not go down that rabbit hole right now, only to say that I believe that there is a difference between the state, which is the provincial and federal government, it is constituted in the Constitution, and what happens in communities. Local government is not the state. It isn't, and I could give you know, we could have a long conversation about that. So I want education that is grounded in the community, which is not state. I want all the people who live in that community to be working together on the education of all children. And I would like them to find a way of representing their adult community in which faith is important without it being doctrinized and denominationalized. You and I need to have a beer too. Which we will we'll do. Uh, a question to John Levy. I'd like you to defend your um, support of the separate school system in light of some of the experiences I had in it. Uh, and I kind of just graduated, so they're pretty pretty current. Uh, there was an added requirement for graduation. You had to go to a grad mass, and you had to complete religious studies courses that were um, that were made up by the district. So different districts would have different ones. They weren't a they, they couldn't be used for some universities out of province. And I didn't do too well in those because my views differed. Also, I was disciplined by the principal for not going to a mass when I was 18. And the mass was a requirement for school activity. What is your name, son? What, what, what's, your, what's your first name? Uh, Aaron. Aaron. I wouldn't discipline you at all. I would not. Why would, I, can't ima I don't know what that person was doing. I would not do so. I'm really sorry that you had that experience. When I was the principal of a, of a school, uh, heavens, I mean, I would just talk to you. And if you'd say, I'm not comfortable doing that, I have no trouble with that whatsoever of saying to you, look, that's not a problem. We won't make a big thing of this. Let's just 
Find out how to make yourself comfortable. Um, I have difficulty with separate schools that have a particular set of rules and regulations which hurt you as a person and an individual. I don't know how sensitive this person is or that person is. I've done this as the principal of a school. When I've had a kid who come into me and he's got a problem and she's got a problem. I'm a teacher first, and a human being. I'm gonna put the law over there and I'm gonna put the church over there and I'm gonna help that child. That's what I do as a human being, first and foremost. And if you had trouble and difficulty with that, I would step up and I would say, how can I help you? Let's make it easier or better for you. It is wrong, in my opinion, to have you, even now that you've graduated, to be thinking that that was a difficult situation for you. I, as the principal of a school, would not allow it. So let me say to you, because you went to a Catholic school, I apologize. I it shouldn't have happened. It shouldn't have happened. Hi, Dr. Donlevy and Mr. King. I am also a recent graduate of a Catholic high school here in Edmonton. Um, when I was applying for a high school, I applied for my specific, I know, anecdotal evidence, your favorite in debate, right? Yeah, anyways, um, when I applied for this high school, it's considered to be an academic high school, meaning that I had to write essays, do tests and things before that I was allowed to enter them into this high school. But at the same time, I was filling out the general application that you would do for a high school. And it is stated in this application that to be prioritized, the first thing, is that to be accepted into this high school, you have to be a Catholic. Now, do you believe that um, in a school, high school that has special programming for advanced students, that it is just to prioritize students of a certain faith? No, I think anybody should come in. But what if, as I, as a student who is not Catholic, if I am put against another student? If there's room, take them. But if not? Would you pick the Catholic student over the not Catholic student? And is it fair to use public funding to put programming towards? But you've got a couple of questions there? Yes. Right? And I think the, 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 you've got a question of fairness, right? Two people fully qualified. Why would we take one over the other? Or maybe you were more qualified as a, as a non Catholic. I was just to go, this is just more of a well, theoretical thing. Yeah, I'm not like, it's not a personal vendetta. Anyways. Okay. <laughs> All good. <laughs> I've got a few personal vendettas about a nun who used to strap me all the time, believe me. Yeah. Uh, but in any event, uh, the difficulty is this. You, when, you establish, when, you, when you establish a school for a particular purpose, mm -hmm. normally you've established for the community. I mean, under the School Act, the community, that particular, those ratepayers have, uh, have registered and they've started the school. So you normally would take people from that community. But if there's any space or any openings, of course you would bring in other people. I went to a school where the principal of the school was a, was a non-Catholic. Uh, I've had seen other people who've taken these positions. It really is a question is, is there space? And if there's space, we'll take them. We have to take them. Catholics have to take them, as a matter of fact. Uh, my daughter, for example, doesn't teach in the Catholic school system because she has some difficulties with it. She teaches in the public school system. That's the wonderful thing about Alberta because of choice, right? Mm -hmm. People can move around. This is my daughter, right? Her father's Catholic. She's a Buddhist. Go figure. Yeah. Things happen, <laughs> right? So all I'm saying is that this wonderful thing about choice and free will that people have, and we accept the consequences. And I missed the second part of the question. Oh, I was just going to say that um, wouldn't it just be easier if it was all public schooling and that kids were admitted into school based on merit or oh, whatever other reason? Oh, and it would be so much easier if we all thought the same. It would really be so much easier. We don't. We simply don't. So I'm simply saying there's a certain amount of choice, there's a certain amount of free will involved. Mm -hmm. If you put everybody together, you're still going to have people on a priority list. Yeah. So well, would, yeah, okay, I'm going to have to, yeah. sorry, I, I hate to do this because I know there are people who really want to ask questions and I, 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 uh, we're just running out of time. And so I'm going to have to ask you to, I'm sorry, to uh, ask your questions afterwards. Our speakers are willing to stay and, and answer questions afterwards for a few minutes. So, uh, so uh, I'm just going to thank our two debaters uh, very much. This was a very, very wonderful debate. I have to say, we both both our debaters uh, put.
put a lot of time and effort into their positions. And we really did get two very, very different points of view. So we, we really can't be more thankful to you. So thank you. I'd also like to thank the audience for your engagement and, uh, and also our law students who assisted us today with, uh, with organizing the event and our administrator, Adam Drager, for, for his organizational efforts. So please do fill out uh, your evaluation form if you have any feedback. I'm a little nervous about receiving it now. But I'd also like to thank, our, to give you uh, debaters our, uh, a, a little token of our appreciation. And uh, so... Right, and uh, à la prochaine. Thank you.